Like many another, Jack Roberts believed that what was going on in South Wales was part and parcel of a process of change which would bring about a new world. The Russian Revolution is only about 10 years of, of age by this time. And it was in the mind of many, many people throughout the world. And rightly or wrongly, whether the reports were right or not, it doesn't matter, but they had acquired the whole of Russia in their own hands. All this wealth and problems and whatever I was going with it. And I felt that the same thing could apply here. How did Spain look to a young Welshman abroad for the first time? In 1933, Gwyn Thomas, with an Oxford degree in Spanish behind him. How did you get to Oxford, Gwyn? I got on the wrong bus in Bargoyne. Now, Gwyn Thomas headed for Madrid University. When you passed over the mountains into Spain, you had the awareness of something completely new. Everybody you spoke to had the feeling that these great thick shrouds that had been weighing upon them for three or four hundred years had been shaken off. Because, you see, what had happened in Spain was this. In 1931, the king, Alfonso XIII, with nobody's blessing behind him, had left Spain and cleared out the treasury and so going. And they were doing the most remarkable things. For the first time, a country was sending writers out to be their ambassadors in all the capitals of the world. Whereas for centuries past, only the most immaculate aristocrats had represented Spain. Now you had fine novelists, fine dramatists, fine musicians. And you felt this in everything you saw, everyone you talked to. And of course, the great payoff line was the University of Madrid, to which I went as a student. It was new. It was brand new. It was the first university ever created in Spain outside the orbit of the church. It was the first attempt by a worldly government to create an educational system for working, living, unbelieving people, if you like. People who wanted to try something new. The plight of the people and the kinship he felt with them were things which moved Gwyn Thomas as he wandered in Spain before the Civil War. Given his Ronda background, that was inevitable. But he had, too, a strong feeling that amounted to certainty that a turning point in Spanish history was not far off. In the late summer of 1933, I had a very peculiar experience. It was a kind of mirror experience. I walked around the mining countryside around Oviedo in the Asturias in northwestern Spain. And there were times on that journey when I felt as if I was walking into villages in the Ronda and the other South Wales mining valleys because you had the same warmth, the same kindliness, but above all, the same marvellous intensity about these people. They realised that they had been living intolerable lives for a long, long time and tolerance was running out. 1933, a very important date, because within a year, that part of Spain was going to erupt in one of the most serious revolts of the common people that Spain had ever known. I've often heard about the apocalyptic sense of people who know that next Thursday morning the evils of last Thursday morning will be no more. That anger will rise like a great lion. And you can imagine that on the plains of Castile, this great tawny lion that will come and eat injustice. It's an image that haunts the great dramatists of Spain. The avenging, justifying will come along and put all to right. And they felt that. And of course, the effect of this on my own people in 1934 
now getting nearer, of course, the vital date of 1936. In the autumn of 1934, there was one of those massive, ineffable disasters in a Welsh pit with which we are so familiar. These are part of our folklore. Our folk history has been lived in terms of these vast, obscene convulsions. It is impossible to describe them in logical, rational ways. They are a dirt upon the memory. Gressford in North Wales blew up a few hundred miners and a terrible grief filled the land. One of my friends worked at Gresford Colliery and he used to talk about the dangers. And colliers didn't talk about danger because danger was with you every day, in every colliery. And I asked him one day, well, why are you always moaning about the danger, you know? Everybody's got danger in the coal mine. Well, he said, we've got extraordinary dangers at Gresford. We'll pay the penny an hour for working in heat, uh, extra, which meant that uh, the ventilation was wrong. Then he said the 3,000-volt uh, uh, cables leading to the coal cutters were uh, faulty, the rubber and uh, metal uh, covering were damaged and they were sparking and there was, uh, the place was heavily gassed and this was in the, he worked in the dentist district he was one of those in Belt I was working at Bersham Colliery, working nights and uh, the night shift that went down at Dressford same time as we did uh, well we heard in the middle of the night that there'd been an explosion and uh, I went to the colliery and there were thousands of people there and everybody milling about and women crying and so on and newspaper reporters hanging about. So they were calling for volunteers. Apparently you couldn't stay down very long. So I left my jacket in the lamp room and took a, a sandbag and uh, a fire extinguisher and went down uh, with a lamp, of course an oil lamp. And it was really Dante's Inferno. Uh, terrible then. It was obvious we wouldn't be able to get anything out alive from there. And I was down for about four hours and then you had to go, you couldn't stick it because possibilities were of another explosion. This, to me, had happened because of criminal neglect of the normal uh, mines regulations. And uh, on the Sunday, in my village at Hoss, uh, they called a union meeting. And uh, the chairman went on his knees and he asked uh, the Almighty to forgive us all for calling a union meeting on a Sunday. Uh, but the object of the meeting was to have volunteers to go to Gresford and try and get at our colleagues. Then in October, a few weeks, a few weeks after Gresford, the miners of the Asturias revolted. And time and again in the Ronda Valley I would stop at this corner and that and talk to the men and they saw the logic of this. That a thing had happened in Gresford that had appalled them in a way that they had not known for a long time past. Because you see, the life of the miner viewed as a whole is a kind of and all the cosmetic increases in conditions and pay will not alter this. It is fundamentally an anomaly under the sun that men should leave the sun and, and, and work in these dark and dangerous places. All right, that's well known. But this definitely did fix a mood in South Wales that there was a link between what had happened there, Gresford, and what had happened in the Asturias. And what had happened in northern Spain in the Asturias in 1934 was in all but name the first battle of the Civil War. The army was called in by the government against the coal miners of the area, about 50,000 of them. The previous year there had been a right-wing victory at the polls. Now swinging further right, the government did a deal with a Catholic party dead set against reforms. The miners reacted in fury and rose up with dynamite to storm the police barracks. Then they took a nearby arms factory and came away with 30,000 rifles and machine guns. The fighting went on for a fortnight. The recriminations and the propaganda that grew out of the rebellion were endless. Apart from the couple of thousand deaths and the tens of thousands who had become political prisoners, the whole terrible affair was notable for two things. First, that the Spanish Foreign Legion and Moroccan troops were brought in to fire on Spanish citizens. And second, that the man who was sending the orders and putting down the rising with the utmost savagery, and we'll hear again of the Moors as time goes on, was one General Franco. <laughs> 